Um, my name again, Andrew. Uh, you guys know me as Andy. And uh, I am the director of ministry over at Bible League International, director of U.S. ministry. I've been doing that for about seven years. And I just want to shout out to uh, Diane, Brenda, and Kathy for doing such a good job of repping Bible League. I wanted to give them a little round of applause. You know, they, they came to me and just asked, how can we help Bible League out? And so they've been keeping you informed about Bible League, so I'm not going to go on a lot about that this morning, but I just want to thank them. Um, I also uh, graduated this last April with a Master's of Ministry degree from Kuiper College. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, it, was, it was good. I didn't have Lauren do any of my homework, but she did proofread it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I uh, am happy to be finished with that. And um, I'm also, you guys know that I, I went to this church from the age of 13 to 33, and I've been at Grace for the last couple of years. And um, I've been the youth pastor over at Grace Church, and um, we've, we've grown there. And Pastor John has spent a lot of time with me. So, you know, my name is Mr. Andy Earnshaw on the bulletin. So I'm not, I'm not quite pastor yet, but John has been patient with me and um, helping me. So... Um, we're going we're gonna to read from Philippians 3, verses 12 through 21 this morning. Um, it's going to be up on the screen, but I'd recommend you open up your Bible too, because we're going to be walking through those verses um, verse by verse. So that's on page 1166, Philippians 3, verses 12 through 21. Before we read that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it's not just some textbook, that it's not just some information that we need to know. It's not a history book. It's not, a, it's not for those purposes, God. You reveal a lot about your purposes. You reveal a lot about your people in that. But God, it's, it's alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, God. It's, it's the guide in which you call us to, to hold in our hands, to keep on our lips, Father. And we ask that you would help us, Lord that we would see what you're speaking to us this morning, Father, that you would cut our hearts, Lord, that we would um, see what you're saying to us, Father, and that we would live this out, not just individually, but as the church, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Philippians 3, verses 12 through 21. And Paul's starting, I'm starting this kind of in the middle of a thought that Paul is in. He says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. What he's saying there, he's, he hasn't already died. He hasn't been perfected yet. All right, so he, he hasn't been perfect. He's, he's not there yet, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we've already obtained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now even tell you with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is the word of the Lord. So we're going to look at three different things today, just so you can have a little mental framework here. We're going to look at why, why we press on, why we're pressing on. We're going to look at why, we're going to look at what, which is the goal of pressing on, and then we're going to look at how to press on. So why, what, and how. Uh, we all have different things that we're pressing on to in our life, and so rather than just going through the list of all the different things that you could be pressing on to, I just want you to close your eyes for a sec and imagine this. Imagine that if somebody was watching your life on TV this last week and you were the main character, what would they see you pressing on towards? You got it? All right, for some of us, we're pressing on to the, 
to the general American dream, right? The dream of having a nice house, having a good job that provides us with plenty of financial independence. Maybe it's just uh, the idea of having a good family, making sure that our kids get dropped off at soccer practice and they're, they're doing great in school and we want to make sure that, that we have a nice looking family. We're pressing on towards that. You know, we just got done with summer vacation and, you know, a lot of us come back to work and we got those summertime blues because we were pressing on to that vacation all year round. And now it's done. Maybe that's the thing that we're pressing on to. Maybe you're in high school. Maybe you're, maybe you're pressing on to finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend or to getting good grades, right? These are, these are all good things to press on to, right? My son, uh, he's eight years old. He's, he's saving up for a Nintendo Switch. Um, he's been working and trying to earn money and asking me, Dad, you know, what can I do to, to earn money? And I, I like that. I, I like that he's pressing on towards earning some money and, and being responsible. And work keeps us from slothfulness. It keeps us from being idle. It's a good thing. But what's often wrong is the place and the priority that those things take in our lives. Paul knew about hard work. Earlier in this chapter, Paul talks about being a Hebrew among Hebrews, right? He was the, uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. He had the best teachers. And um, I had good teachers too, but I wasted my opportunities in high school and stuff like that. I didn't do very well. But Paul, Paul took advantage of his opportunities. He, he worked hard. He was on a good trajectory in his life. In fact, um, he was already in leadership as a young guy, Right? He, he worked hard. He knew about pressing on. But something happened to Paul. His perspectives and his priorities changed. Because we, a lot of us know this story. If you've grown up in the church, Paul's on his way to Damascus and all of a sudden he gets knocked off his horse. And the people that he's been persecuting, the people that he's been overseeing the death of, holding people's coats as they stone Christian, all of a sudden, he meets Jesus, the one that he's been persecuting, the one that he's been stoning the, his followers, right? How terrifying would that be? That'd be pretty scary. All of a sudden, you, you think you're doing the right thing. You think you're holding down the, the law. And this guy comes onto the scene claiming that he's the son of God. And you go, no, I'm not going to have this. And then you realize that after you've killed a few of his disciples, that he was who he said he was. And so Paul's probably sitting there like Isaiah going, woe is me, you know, I, I messed up. I, he's probably thinking that the earth is just going to break open and swallow him up. But what, is, what does Paul encounter in that situation? Does he encounter wrath? No, he encounters grace. He encounters love. He encounters mercy. He encounters uh, a new life rather than judgment and rather than wrath. He had the most important realization that he could ever have is that he could never find his satisfaction in his own achievements. And um, Paul didn't just kick up his legs and take it easy after that, right? He could have just said, oh, I'm, I'm saved by grace. I had this realization. But what did he do? He actually went on to, to work probably even harder than what he was doing before. He went on to plant churches all around the area. He was always traveling. He was always getting in trouble. He was uh, being stoned. He was he, all these things. And when he wasn't doing that, he was making tents. So he knew about hard work. And we feel that tension, don't we? Sometimes that um, we can never find the satisfaction that we need in our own achievements. And there's still something missing. And even Jim Carrey said in a commencement speech a while back, he says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. And if Jim Carrey can say that, we as Christians should be able to say that, right? We should know. Um, we're never going to find the safety, security, respect, love, righteousness, enoughness in ourselves. So why do we press on? Why do we work hard? Let's look, because this is, this is our motivation. This is why we press on. Verse 12, an important verse. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I find these verses uh, really comforting, really comforting because I'm really not good at assembling things. 
Um, if, you, if you show up to my house and you give me an Ikea box and you tell me to, to put that together, that's like uh, three days in prison camp for me. That, I mean, that's, I just don't, I don't want to do it. It's like a death sentence. And I try to be there for my kids. I try to help them out with the Legos, but boy, is that just not my cup of tea. It's just not, just not my thing. And, um, you know, it's even worse when, when somebody's relying on you to get something done, like you're a part of the process and you need to get this part done so that they can get their part done. Um, I used to work construction for my Uncle Norm. I'm looking for him here, but I don't see him. I know he's here somewhere. Um, but I used to work for him and uh, he was a patient guy. He was loving, but his construction crew would sometimes um, just kind of be waiting on me to finish up the scaffolding so that they can get on there and get on with their job. And I would just hear this. As they, as they sat behind me waiting for me to get my part of the job done. And what happens when we feel that? Does that make us work harder? Does that make us feel good to get the job done? No, no, it doesn't. I'd fumble, I'd drop the screws, I'd drop the nut, I'd, I, you know, and I would just be frustrated with myself. And sometimes we picture God that way, don't we? We think that we need to assemble our lives that we need to make sure that we have everything together. That we, if, if we don't step into this, if we don't do this, the whole world's going to fall apart. If I don't get this done, the whole world's going to fall apart. Don't we feel that way and we feel like God's getting ready just to go enough and slap us across the back of the head? But that's not our God. Our God is kind. Our God is loving. Our God is a father. And just like a good father sits with his child and, and has the blueprints to the model airplane, He's not worried that the kid's not going to finish the job. He knows. He's directing us. I got an example of this just from my personal life. I was wondering if I should say it or not, but you know, my, my in-laws gifted us a grill when we first got married, and it, it was in a box, and we were able to put it together, and I was sitting there going, oh, man, ah, I don't want to do this. And uh, I'm like, you know what? I should put the grill together. I got to say that I put the grill together because I'm the man. I don't want to be any less of a man for not doing that job and saying my wife did it over the weekend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I go, Lauren, I, you know, I don't want to put this together, but, you know, I know I should. She goes, let's do it together. And she took the instruction manual and just directed me piece by piece what to do. And then I'd get frustrated with myself. I'd put the wrong screw in the wrong thing and I'd go, ah, and she'd go, hey, it's all right. Just take that screw, put it back in here. And that's the picture that we have with God. God loves us. He's got the pieces. He's, he's got the plan. And he wants, to, he wants us to participate in it. You know, just like if I were to sit down with my dad and start breaking the piece of the model airplane, he'd go, hey, let's get you back on track here. But he loves us, and he's got it. And, and the cause of our anxiety a lot of times is believing that God doesn't have it, is believing that we're in the center that is the deepest cause of our anxiety, is to think that we need to be the one that gets it together, that we need to have things go the way that we want them to go, rather than trusting in God, rather than trusting that God is going to carry out what he's going to carry out in our lives. And so our fears go, our, our, our fears go to faith as we realize this. Our, our motives go from fear to faith. Because if Christ made me his own, I can step into the things I fear the most. Jesus is working out everything for our good. You look at Romans 8, verses 28. God works out all things for the good of those he's called according to his purpose and to conform us into the likeness of Christ. And really, we can, if we realize that, we can let go of our cares and concerns. Right? Just like we talked about this morning, rather than getting worried, rather than getting frustrated, we go to God in prayer. We trust him. And really, relationship with God is the only thing that really makes a difference in our lives. And... If we realize that this world is vapor, but eternity is everything, we, we can trust in God. We can know that we can step out. We can talk to a non-believer. We can tell somebody about Jesus without fear of rejection. We can disciple people without worrying that we're going to get it wrong. Right? We can step into the things that fear, fear the most. The fact that I'm here, you guys, you guys know me. Why am I here right now? You know? This is, I'm a goofball. It was, you know barely made it through school. And, and I can go, oh boy, I'm, I'm getting up at First Church this morning. I'm really nervous. But God goes, I've called you. 
I've called you. You can step into this. And so that is the relationship that we're seeing here. And, and God is calling us to step into these things. And we can, we can be motivated. You know, there's so many people pressing on to earn their salvation. Right? There's so many people around the world that are, are pressing on to be reincarnated into the next level. There's so many people pressing on to making sure that they make uh, you know, the pilgrimage to, to Mecca and they pray five times a day and they're nervous all the time because, boy, i got to earn my salvation. But we see here that Christ has paid the price for our sins, right? He has died on the cross. We do not have to worry about that anymore. So we can step into what God is calling us into. He's given us salvation. He's even not just given us salvation, but even the faith to believe in Him. Even the Holy Spirit that works in our hearts and calls us. So even the faith and the grace that it takes, the fact that you believe in Christ right now is a gift. And He's working things out in your life that you could not work out. So why do we press on? We press on because we trust in God. We see, just like Paul, if we really see the weight of our sin, the fact that we're no better than Paul, the one that was killing Christians, that all the shame that we've had, all the guilt that we've ever had, every mistake, every intentional sin has been forgiven by Christ, this motivates us, right? We go, God, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being so kind to us. But it starts with repentance and confession. And I just want to invite you, I never want to assume that I'm just talking to a bunch of Christians because I was one of the people that was sitting in here for two years going, I don't believe this stuff. If you have not given your life to Christ and you feel Jesus working in your heart right now going, yeah, I know there's something more to this life. Give your heart to him. Don't harden your heart. It says in the Bible, don't harden your heart when you feel that. And so if we are saved, if we are Christians, if we are followers of Christ, we can trust in God. That's why we press on. So what are we pressing on towards? If we're not pressing on towards our salvation, if we're not pressing on to um, earning things, what are we pressing on towards? Let's look at verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So what is the upward call of God? If it's not, if it's not just earning salvation... What is it? Christ wants you to look like him. He wants you to push on towards looking like him, right? To exchange the life that's heading for destruction, my own things, my own fears, my own sin for his life. He wants us to exchange it, right? We need to be like Mike. You guys know Mike? Michael Jordan, right? I'm not saying this is God's word. I'm saying this is what I think that we need to, we need to be pushing on towards. We need to be like Mike. Michael Jordan changed the face of basketball, right? Um, can you imagine, like, you know, he's, he's working in high school and um, he's trying to get there and he gets drafted into the NBA and he gets a contract for a couple million dollars, all right? And then rather than going on to winning six NBA championships, winning multiple MVP awards, he just kicks up his feet and goes, eh, I got a couple million dollars here. I don't need to work. I don't need to work any harder. Hey, you know what? If my teammates need me, I'll show up to practice once in a while. Can you imagine what basketball would look completely different? But because he was pressing on, he changed things. He, he, he made Chicagoans proud, right? And God is calling us to do something kind of similar to that. And we can get in that mode of going, hey, you know what? Jesus has paid for my sins. I believe in that. I, I, I trust in Jesus just enough basically to not go to hell. That's kind of our, our mentality sometimes. But God is calling us to so much more. He's calling us to press on. And we're not pressing on to some stinking trophies. We're pressing on to the eternal. Something that's going to last for all eternity. All eternity. You know, Jack told me like, last, you know, sometimes we forget these things. Jack, Jack came to me and goes, forever, and, he, and he's trying to wrap his mind around forever. It's impossible. And that's what Jesus is calling us to step into, to press into the things that are eternal, that, that will be there forever. So we press on to those things. I lost my place in my notes. I'll just be honest with you guys. <laughs> you know, I don't do this every week. <laughs> 
So we do this as Christians. We're, we're saved, right? And, and sometimes we just kick our, our feet up. And I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm being legalistic. That's the last thing I want to do here. I, I don't want to say that we go on and press on again. I just want to reinstate that, that it's not legalism. Our Father has a plan and a purpose, and He wants us to realize His potential just like a good father would want any child of His to realize their full potential. So does it say that pushing on towards the, the goal is, is drudgery? Does it say that push on towards the drudgery of the Christian life? Sometimes we feel that way. It doesn't say that. It says it's a prize. Push on towards the prize. I want to, I want to show you four ways of this prize. First off, the eternal thing, right? We're pressing on to something more than trophies. We're pressing on to something more than what's fleeting, our finances, our cars, our homes. We're pushing on to being transformed into the image of Christ. But we also get fulfillment and purpose. Before, when I was just living my own way, when I was just doing my thing, I was miserable. You know, when I, when I would push God away and go, God, I don't need your way. I'm just going to do things my own way. That only got me depression, anxiety, impulsive suicidal thoughts. <laughs> That's where my way got me. But God is calling us to a better way, a life filled with purpose and with fulfillment, one that you can look back on and say, I'm satisfied. I thank you, Jesus, for using my life. That when you get to heaven someday, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That is the thing that is the most important thing that, that you could go after. But he also gives us a finish line because the world is going, imagine it this way. The world is like a, a big track, right? And there's a bunch of finish lines all over the place. And you got one person over there going, come on, come over here. I got the answer. Power, power. You need power. Come over here. And you run over there and you get there and you go, that's not it. And somebody over there goes, ah, money, money. I, this is the answer to all our problems. Once we get, uh, you know, $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year, we're going to be happy. And you run over there and you go, mm, boy, I just spent 30 years working towards that. That's not the answer. Somebody says influence. Somebody says drugs. Somebody says sex. Somebody says whatever it is. And Jesus is sitting there, the true finish line, going, come to me. You'll find your satisfaction here. And as we push on towards that goal, we start to transform. We start to conform into his image. We start to take on his likeness. We start to see that his promises are true and they're not just a bunch of nothing. We start to see that in prayer we experience his presence. In the silent place, he speaks to us. When we read his word, it starts to work in us and move in us. When we worship, we experience his presence and his goodness. And it's a prize. It's a prize. Because there's nothing better than that. That's the real stuff. Sometimes we're just on autopilot, right? Sometimes we're just doing our thing. And, and we get into a worship environment. And we get into a prayer environment. And all of a sudden, it's like a like a wake-up call, like smelling salts were just held over our nose and we woke up. It's like, whoa, it's not about me. It's not about all this stuff. It's about Jesus. That's another way that it, it's a price. He gives us a finish line. Even His grace, the, the means of grace, prayer, His Word, being able to come here and worship is a prize. Now, that's not to say it's not hard. right? The upward call of Christ is also the way of the cross. And just like Michael Jordan had to work hard, we, we need to work hard. The way of the cross is hard. Sometimes it looks like crucifixion. Sometimes it looks like being rejected by the world. Sometimes it looks like standing for truth when nobody else is standing for truth. Students, sometimes that's going to be really hard for you guys. Because even in a Christian school, the one that's being praised in, a, in school is the one that's going, oh man, you'll never believe what I did this last weekend. You'll never believe this girl I got with or this guy, I hooked up with this guy, and everybody's going, yeah, that's cool, right? Nobody that's going, I'm following after Jesus. Nobody lifts up that person, even, even in Christian schools. And so this is a hard thing. This is, this is feeling like the cross sometimes, but as you step into that, as you step into the way of the cross, you start to see the price that Jesus paid for you that Jesus nailed to a tree could still say, forgive them, right? And, and the fact that Jesus died for your sins, 
Sometimes you have to die to what your expectations are. Sometimes you can't hold on to those resentments because you see the sin in your life and you go, I've been forgiven of that sin. I got to let go of that thing. You got to let go of that bitterness because you see Jesus and what he's done for you. And you may, may say sometimes, you know, I talked about the peace and the joy and the, and the love that we experience as we pursue Christ. And maybe you're saying, you know, I haven't experienced that. That's not been my experience. I've been, I've been a Christian all my life and I've been really going through it these last three years. I've had a chronic illness that has plagued me every single day and I'm just holding on. Maybe you've had a, a parent die or a spouse die or a son or daughter die. Maybe your children are far away from the Lord and you're going, what is the deal, God? Come on. Sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes it feels like, like you're really going through it. Paul talked about that. Paul understood that when he was writing. Remember Paul, right? He's, he's on this upward trajectory. Man, his career is looking bright. He's, he's probably going to be honored. He's going to be invited to the best houses. He's going to have the best food. People are going to take care of him. Where did he write this letter? Prison. He wrote it in prison. Paul knew all about suffering. He knew what it was like to give up things. He knew what it was like to go through it. And even still, I wish we could read the whole chapter and go through the whole uh, Philippians 3 today, but we don't have time. But he says, I count all that stuff as rubbish. I count all my own righteousness, all the stuff I had before as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, does that sound like some floaty, abstract, oh, we have some relationship with God? Or does that sound like some solid stuff that's going to get you through pain, that's going to get you through suffering? Paul had this relationship, and it's not just Paul that has this relationship. We can have this relationship. Sometimes, you know, it's just about being towed by a tow rope. <laughs> Sometimes God's just got us hooked up to a tow rope, and he's going, please don't drive off, off the road back there. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to move you towards the finish line. We struggle, and, and you know, I, I think it's encouraging to see the older saints that have come for years and that continue to praise God and continue to, to, to talk about the goodness of God, even in their struggles, even in their pain, because it shows us, it shows us that um, it's true. And this is what distinguishes mature believers from the immature believers. Paul says in verse 15, look at verse 15 with me. Let those of us who are mature think this way. So how does he describe mature believers? Paul knows that um, mature believers see the difference between good and evil, right? And um, sometimes it's easy as you grow in your sanctification, as you grow as a believer, to go, man, look at this world. Ugh, sinful, dark. You know, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, good thing I'm not part of this world and I'm over here. But I want us to notice real quick, and this doesn't have much to do with the main text, but it's just a note here. Paul says, let those of, who, of us who are mature think this way. He doesn't say, let those of us who are mature think the way that I, I think. And here's the three paragraphs of the reason why you think, I think you should think this way. He says, no, I trust those people to God. If you don't believe the way that I believe, God will reveal that to you. And I want to make us a, a note here because I, I was part of this church for years and it's really easy to get discouraged by the world. But trust in God. Mature believers, trust in God that, that he's going to work things out. right? That you don't need to explain everything. That you don't need to convince or persuade everybody to exactly the way that you think. You may be mature in your faith, but Paul says God will work in that situation. Stick to the truth. Hold on to it. Realize that God may use you in someone's life, but you don't always need to just express your opinion in that. So we see the why. We see the what, which is the upward call. How do we do this? How do we do this? We're looking at uh, three ways from verses 13 and 17. I'm going to be jumping around the text a little bit here. Look at verse 13 with me. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Has anybody here ever seen Napoleon Dynamite? You guys know that movie? There's a, a movie called Napoleon Dynamite. 
uh, there's this character named Uncle Rico who has got this big stash and he's got this bowl cut and he's trapped in 1982. All right? And he continues to think over and over again, boy, if my coach would have just put me in state and that final game, I'd be rich and famous. I'd have everything I'd ever need. But because he didn't do that, look at, look at me now, right? And he just continues to make these videos of himself throwing a football in a field. Just, he just keeps on relieve, reliving this past over and over again. And we can be like Uncle Rico sometimes, can't we? We may think, man, I felt God was calling me at one time to be a missionary, and I, and I rejected that call. God was calling me to, to pastor, and I, and I just didn't do it. Or maybe worse, you could say, you know what? I sinned so bad. <laughs> I sinned. I just messed up so bad. I am not qualified. But again, we can look at what Paul says here. Right? Paul says, if Paul says, the executor of Christians, the murderer, says that he gets to forget what lies in the past and strain on towards what lies ahead, how much more can we? Right? Sometimes we need to forget the past. Sometimes we need to let go. Right? The famous thing, let go and let God. Right? And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes we're resting on our laurels. You know, sometimes we look back at a mission trip that we did when we were 18 years old and we went, oh, that's good. I went to that. I did that. I went to this serve event. I'm set. But Paul is saying, hey, whether it's good or bad, forget what lies behind you. Keep straining towards the goal. Keep, keep pressing on towards the goal. That's one of the ways that, that he, he, he calls us to, to keep moving forward and we can't rest on our laurels, right? The second thing is found in verse 17. Paul says, imitate me. He says in another chapter, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But this says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. You know, you ever read Paul and, and think, boy, this guy's arrogant. <laughs> you ever think that? I don't think he's arrogant. But, you know, if somebody said, if I, if I came up to you this morning and said, hey, you know what, imitate me. As, uh, Im just imitate me, your life will go better. Paul's not saying that that way. Before I was at Bible League, a lot of you guys know I was the director of sales at uh, Four Seasons, working for Ryan Brinesman. And um, I was like 25, and I didn't know what I was doing, but I was good at sales. And I'd write all these sales scripts out and all these things to say over the phone to lock in a sale, right? And... Um, when, then, when somebody would come in and I had to train them up, I would just basically hand them a pile of scripts and say, read these things over the phone and close the sale. And people would be like, really, this is it? And, and they would start talking and they would sound robotic and it just would not work for them. And that's how we see the word a lot of times, right? The word is our guide. The word is our standard. That's, that is essential to the Christian life. But sometimes we need to see it embodied. And it wasn't until I started going, here, walk with me as I walk through this. I'm going to show you how to, how to overcome these objections. I'm going to show you how to work through this thing. And people start to understand as they, as they see it modeled. And we need Christians in our life that are modeling, that are actually embodying the Word of God in this life. And that's incredibly important. And I want to talk to you, just you guys here. You guys are looking for a pastor. Right? We need leadership. We need pastors. We need these things. But I want to encourage you. Um, the church is not a Sunday service. Right? The church, we are the church. We set the culture of this church, not, not just the pastor. And so if somebody comes in that's a non-believer and just looks at, at the congregation and, and learns that's what a Christian looks like, what would they, what would they experience? What would they, what would they feel? And it's important for us to remember that we are the church, that we set the culture. Pastors do provide leadership. They do definitely impact the culture. But we need to be imitatable as well. That's the third thing. We need, we need somebody to imitate and we need to be imitatable. And God is calling us to do that. We need to be making disciples. We need to be, be sharing our faith. Even more than that, we need to be sharing each other's burdens. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be people of prayer. And so, this is what God has called us to, right? This is, this is some of the ways how. It's forgetting the past, pushing on, imitate the believers that are, are walking it out, and do yourself be imitatable. That's how we do it. 
And I just want to look quickly at, at the last couple of verses here, verses 18 and 19. We don't have to spend too much time on these verses, but it's just a contrast. Because he says in verse 18 and 19, For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. We all know what this looks like, right? Their God is their belly. It means going after every single impulse that we ever have, right? It means just giving in to whatever we feel like doing whenever we want to. Saying what we want to say. Gossiping about who we want to gossip about. Looking at things that we shouldn't look at. Eating whatever we want to all the time. Sleeping around with whoever we want to sleep on. Drinking as much as we want to drink. That's what the world looks like. That's what an enemy of the cross looks like, Paul says here. Just give in to impulses. Boy, do I have a hard time with that. <laughs> I am given to impulses. I am naturally just, I, I just cling to those things. But look at what else Paul says here. He says, not only do they do that, they glory in their shame. They glory in their shame. Now, there's some very obvious ways of people glorying in the shame. We think of like, um, you know, Gay Pride Month. That's glorying in shame. If Jesus says, the Bible says directly, don't do these things, we celebrate it, right? But that's not just, this isn't written to the secular world, this is written to Christians. And sometimes we go, oh man, you know, I got so wasted this weekend. You know, like high school students, like I was talking to you earlier, right? Oh man, I got with this girl, I got with this guy, oh, I did this, oh man, we had such a crazy party the other night. Glorying in our shame. We gossip about other people. Oh, I'm so glad I'm not like that person. I'm so glad I don't have those issues glorying in our shame, right? That's, that's an enemy of the cross. Mindset on earthly things. Another thing, mindset on earthly things. Materialism, hedonism. When can I get that next house? When can I get that next car? When, I, when can I get that next boat? Just totally fixed on those things. Again, nothing wrong with those things. I love that my parents have a boat. We go out all the time on the weekends. Love it. <laughs> but if my mind is just set on those things all the time, there's a problem there. Right? And Paul concludes that with whose fate is to con destruction. Right? The ones that are, their God is their belly. They do whatever they want. They glory in their shame. Their minds on earthly things. Whose fate is destruction. Destruction. Man, that's scary. Isn't that scary? This scares me because my mind is set on earthly things a lot of the time. You know, hang around with my parents. They'll always tell you, I don't go more than an hour without thinking what I'm going to eat. <laughs> you know? Thinking about what we're having for lunch today, right? I was thinking about that this morning. <laughs> so am I, am I heading for destruction? Mm. The upward call is not about never making a mistake. We strive for looking like Christ. We strive for holiness. We strive for perfection. But we can take a note here. Paul says twice, twice. The guy that wrote a major part of the New Testament, he says twice, hey, I'm not perfect yet. I haven't reached it yet. I'm not perfect yet. If Paul can say that, then we can say that. He can say, imitate me. He can say, I push on towards the prize. He can say, I count it all as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And we can say that same thing and we can realize that it's not about perfection. It's about progress. It's about pushing on. It's about pressing on. It's about relying on the Holy Spirit. It's about having faith in God as the Lord of your life. Having faith in Jesus. It's not about never making a mistake. It's about trusting in God. God, the loving Father who is there for you. Christ, who sometimes have to, has to take you over his shoulders and carry you across that finish line just because you don't have it in you. That's what he's calling us to here. Press on to who you really are. The final verse, verse 20. Who are you? Are you a Northeast Illinois, Northwest Indiana, upper middle class, Dutch, Hispanic, African American citizen? of the United States? No. What does it say? Your citizenship is in heaven. 
let's remember that this is who we are. We are not citizens of America. We are sons and daughters of the Most High King. The one who has saved us from this destruction. The one who sits on the throne with angels worshiping Him for all eternity, going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. That's the King that we worship. That's our Father. That is who we are. That is our identity. That is who God is calling us to step into, to, to rule and to reign with Christ Jesus someday. Wow! And we can start that here on earth. We can press into these goals here and now. We can, we can pray, God, bring the kingdom of heaven to this earth. Let me be of impact. Let me be of influence. Let me not just waste my life. Let me live for you, my King, and lay it all down before you. That's what Christ is calling us into. So let's remember, let's remember that this is the King that we serve and someday there's going to be no more tears. There's going to be no more anxiety. There's going to be no more pain. There's going to be none of that. And we get to serve this King. We get to serve Him. No more sadness. This life is a vapor. we got all of eternity to look forward to spending with Christ. So keep pushing towards the goal. And let's put this king first in our life. Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love, your compassion. We thank you that you, God, when we make a mistake, you don't just send us off to destruction, but Lord, that you're with us like a good father. That you love us, God. That you have the plans. That you have our purpose, God. We can't see it. We see through a glass dimly. But Lord, you see the whole thing. So Lord, we ask that you'd help us to walk with you. Father, realizing that you have us and even the fact that we believe is by grace and grace alone. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.